the other piece of housekeeping I want to mention is just that uh, we do have live transcript available. So if you need subtitles, uh, it is enabled. It's an option on the bottom of your screen under that little more function. So if you've never turned it on again, there's the little ellipsis, the three dots, you can hit more uh, and hit show subtitles or view full transcript if you want to see it all on one page. So for accessibility reasons, or if you just prefer to engage with content that way, it is now an option for you. Uh, other than that, I don't have a whole lot to share tonight because I am not the expert on the topic. I am here to support you in engaging with it though. So if you need tech support or you have any trouble at any point, you have my email and my phone number from the reminder I sent out yesterday. Uh, and I'm also keeping an eye on the chat. So feel free to reach out to me any way that you can and I will do my best to support you. So I think, have I missed anything, Valerie? It's been a couple, it's been a while since we did one of these. So I'm trying to remember exactly what we cover, but it looks like we're good. So I'm gonna pass it over to Got Valerie Millery. <laughs> Millie Thank Miller. <laughs> Thank you so much, Cassidy. Welcome, everyone. We're so happy to have you here for the launch of the 2022 Energy Talks, actually our second year anniversary this talk. So thank you so much for joining us. We are going to start with a land acknowledgement. We want to respectfully acknowledge that the University of Alberta is located on Treaty 6 territory, a traditional gathering place for diverse Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Salto, Anishinaabe, Inuit, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant communities. As we explore the energy systems around us, we acknowledge the territories, communities, and peoples that have been essential partners in this research. We are truly grateful to have had the opportunity to work, study, and live on this land. And now I want to do a brief introduction to future energy systems, uh, some little bit of housekeeping, and then I'm going to pass it off because like Cassidy said, we are not the experts here tonight. So future energy systems for anyone that this is your first talk is a research program at the University of Alberta. It launched in 2016 with $75 million from the Government of Canada's Canada First Research Excellence Fund to help Canada transition to a low net carbon energy economy. We focus on multidisciplinary research uh, that examines the energy technologies of the near future, integrates them into, into today's infrastructure, and examines possible consequences for our society, economy, and environment. We also contribute to the development of solutions for challenges presented by current energy systems. We have over 110 projects, over 150 researchers, and over 850 graduate students, postdocs, and other highly qualified personnel. So give us a chance and we will take over uh, we are so happy to be here tonight to explore one of those research areas. A couple housekeeping things. Uh, we will have a Q&A at the end of the session, but feel free to pop all of your questions in the chat throughout the entire talk, and we will keep track of those. We don't want you to lose your questions because you're thinking of all these new questions by the end. You are welcome to come online to share your questions. Uh, but you can also just pop them in the chat and I will moderate that. We do wish to remind current and future viewers that the opinions expressed by the speaker are not necessarily those of the Edmonton Public Library, Future Energy Systems, or the University of Alberta. And without further ado, I'm not going to talk anymore. Uh, I'm going to pass it off to our speaker tonight. Laurie Thorlaxon is a professor in the Department of Political Science at the U of A. She holds a PhD from the London School of Economics. With Dr. Melanie Thomas, she is the co-principal investigator of the Future Energy Systems Project, Assessing Political Pathways of Energy Transition, which examines drivers of public opinion on climate policies in Canadian provinces and the relationship between elite framing of energy issues and public opinion. Welcome, Laurie. We're so happy to have you here. Oh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here tonight and welcome everyone and happy new year and welcome to the, the first um, 
talk of, of 2022. Um, I'm speaking tonight on uh, the topic of a few papers that, that my team's recently published. The title of my talk is The Best is Yet to Come, How Beliefs About the Future of Oil and Gas Shape Energy Transition. I want to start with this one thought. Now this, this is um, something written by um, a team of political scientists at, at Zurich who, who specialize in, in studying the politics of climate change. One of the things they observed was in many, if not most countries, rapid progress towards a low carbon economy seems technically feasible, but politically impossible. So technically feasible, but politically impossible. We have the technology to move swiftly to a low carbon economy and to complete the energy transition. The hurdles that remain are political. And so it is, it's a fascinating political science problem, but, and it is a very urgent problem because it, it, it's of great importance for our future. This is the problem this, that is the, at the center of the work that I do with my team. And I'm working together with a team um, it's a joint University of Alberta and University of Calgary team. So my, my colleague and co-principal investigator, Melanie Thomas is a political scientist at the University of Calgary. Um, and for the research that I'll be talking about tonight, it's, it's been produced as a team effort with Brooks de Cilia, uh, Christian Schimpf, Nikita Slepkov and John Santos. So I'm going to begin with the idea of energy transition. So I, I think that most of us have an idea of what energy transition is. So energy transition involves a movement to a low carbon economy. It means that we have to move away from fossil fuels and toward a carbon neutral or a carbon zero situation. And it's one of the key steps that we need to in order to implement the Paris Agreement that was agreed in 2015 uh, with the goal of limiting global warming to below two degrees Celsius and preferably to 1.5 degrees Celsius. So this involves a massive decarbonization of the energy sector and uh, with the goal of becoming net zero emissions by mid-century. One of the aspects of energy transition that's I think important to consider and important to think about is the fact that it, it's, it's not simply, it's, it's not just a technical exercise, it is a structural transformation of the economy. And uh, yesterday the Guardian reported, you can see on the screen there, the Guardian reported on a new report released by the consultancy McKinsey who concluded that energy transition is going to involve a fundamental transformation of the global economy and that this is needed and moreover that this fundamental transformation um, also requires an enormous investment both public and private to the tune of about 9.2 trillion dollars they've estimated um, and so they call it a fundamental transformation of the world economy and it's worth thinking about that because if we, if we think about times in history when we have had a fundamental um, transformation of the economy, it has, and um, as well as when we have had um, technological transformations, these also are times of great political and social change and political and social upheaval. And so in order to understand th the energy transition, we cannot just understand it as a technical um, and technological exercise. We can't just understand it as an economic exercise, but it's technological, it is economic, it is political and it is social. And it involves major forces of change and it will reverberate. So with my team, this one of the things that we're very interested in is understanding how these political forces are being shaped. And what are the, what are the dividing lines? How are these changing over time? what does decarbonization backlash look like and what drives it? And so we've all seen this you know, over the past few years and we've seen the Yellow Vest movement and how, um, how decarbonization backlash also gets tied up with other movements of populism perhaps and, and about protests of, of cost of living. 
um, maybe anti-elitism. So it is untangling these that is at really at the center of our agenda. But um, you know, first noting that this is quite an enormous project for the world and, and with the end goal of avoiding catastrophic climate disaster, but also, um, you know, if you look at the sustainable development goals, energy transition is, is not just about avoiding um, catastrophic climate disaster, but it's also about achieving some other very positive changes as well. It's about generating low carbon economic growth and investment opportunities. It's about generating a lower cost and more efficient economy. It is about um, generating opportunities for universal access to affordable energy and increasing global health as well by reducing pollution. So all of these bound up. So this is the enormity of the task. So let's look at Canada now. So what I have is a chart here. It's from um, 2019 from the government of Canada and it shows us what our emissions look like. And so in Canada, what we'll no you'll notice from this, if you look at the two categories, the, the red and the blue at the bottom of the graph, that oil and gas and transportation sectors together make up over half of our emissions, our total emissions in Canada. So about 52%. And so that's a really big chunk. Um, coming in there as well, buildings and so energy efficiency opportunities, um, then um, heavy industry, um, agriculture and, and waste, but transport and oil and gas are the two biggest uh, categories for Canada. And, uh, and, and so this is especially relevant for Alberta because oil and gas is our big industry. So if we look at what our greenhouse gas emissions look like by province and territory, so if we look at Canada, we see that Alberta stands out with um, emissions that are um, in, in megatons that are higher than in any other province. If we were to look at this and, and generate this as in, in per capita terms, we would see that both Alberta and Saskatchewan stand out about, um, quite a bit beyond Quebec and Ontario. Um, we would also see, um, if we looked at over time, we would see that Alberta has also been making recently gains by the, um, by the decarbonization of our electricity grid with our transition away from coal. So we've had some successes, but um, our oil and gas sector is contributing a lot of emissions. And so energy transition is a particular problem for Alberta. It is a particular challenge for um, a fossil fuel intensive economy. And so when we think about energy transition in a place like Alberta, where we have an economy that is, that, um, is heavily dependent on the oil and gas industry, then energy transition means that we've got two existential threats involved. And so one of these is climate change. And so, and we have, a uh, the pressure to undertake the energy transition um, for the, to avoid climate disaster. But the second existential threat is political. It is a political threat to undergo energy transition because we have a lot of vested interests in our oil and gas industry. And so it, it is both an economic interest and a political interest. So we are very interested in, in digging into this and trying to understand how does our response to these threats work and how does it affect people's, um, um, people's response to energy transition and their support for it. Now we know, so when we, when we think about energy transition, when we measure energy transition, we're talking about both a movement toward renewables and we're also talking about a movement away from fossil fuels. And we know from research that has been done in other um, fossil fuel intensive economies that um, these two don't always work in tandem. And so we're also very interested in the case of Alberta of seeing how people's, um, of, of measuring people's attitudes toward energy transition broken down into these components. So we can look at how people feel about moving toward renewables 
and how they at the same time feel about moving away from fossil fuels and how there might be a bit of a gap between those. So let's look at the politics of Alberta. And I, what I have for us here on the screen are a couple of, of um, illustrations of, of, of some of the recent political discourse. And so first I've got a tweet by Jason Kenney up on your sc screen and, and the message is, when our key industry is attacked, we'll fight back. Alberta's oil and gas is critical for Canada's recovery and our long-term prosperity. 800,000 workers rely on it to put food on their tables. We will always stand up for our energy workers. And so this is, it's a, it's a defense of the oil and gas industry. And then on the right, um, a social media message by the Canadian Energy Centre, sometimes referred to as the War Room, um, which also focuses on the economic contribution of the oil and gas industry. So Canada's oil and gas industry is a massive economic driver um, fueling hundreds of thousands of jobs, boosting other sectors and contributing billions to the national economy. Read our latest fact sheet. So it's a very strong, very robust defense of, of the industry. And so we are, when we, when we look, and, and those are two examples, but if we look at how this, um, the, the discourse around oil and gas um, and its defenders has operated, I think we can reasonably interpret this um, as a message that energy transition is an existential threat to Alberta because it is an existential threat to oil. But how many Albertans actually see it that way? So how do, how do Albertans think about it? Um, to what extent do they support energy transition? What elements of energy transition do, do they support? And if they oppose it, who opposes it and why? So this is what we really wanted to know. We wanted to know how people think and feel about moving away from fossil fuels. And is that the same as their attitude toward renewables? We were interested in how socio-demographic attributes, so this you know, standard battery of, of age and gender, um, levels of education, um, also whether you work in the oil and gas industry affects our support for energy transition. Also, how do our values and beliefs, including our ideology, so whether we regard ourselves as left or right, whether we like big government or want government to take a very small role in the economy, what our party identity is, whether we identify as a UCP supporter or an NDP supporter or something else, and as well as whether we believe in anthropogenic climate change and whether or not we're concerned with climate change. And then importantly, we also wanted to understand whether people's beliefs about the future of oil and gas in Alberta are affecting their support for energy transition. We also wanted to know, you know not only um, the extent to which people supported energy transition, but how, uh, whether and how these attitudes can be moved and what moves them. So this is what we did. We conducted a survey of um, just over 2,600 Albertans immediately after the 2019 provincial elections. And in this survey, we embedded an experiment. And so we used to, and, and so we, we asked a number of questions um, about uh, these the questions that we were interested in, invest, in investigating. And then we were also interested in figuring out whether these attitudes could be moved, could be nudged along a little bit. And so we used this embedded experiment in which um, respondents were randomly um, exposed to a short radio news story. So we listened to um, re respondents were allocated either to listen to a short clip of a uh, about a minute and a half of a radio news clip uh, about a positive energy transition story. And so in this case, it was the story of a large scale solar installation near Vulcan, Alberta, which would generate a, a, a great deal of jobs and investment and be very good for the economy. The negative story was a clip about the fate of the town of Hannah um, following in, 
leading up to the closure of the coal mine there and the, and the job losses and the impact on that community. And so these clips, we created them um, from actual CBC news stories, edited them so that they would be identical lengths and um, a third group uh, was a control and heard no story. <clears throat> so we asked them um, about their support for energy transition in a number of different ways. And we had an eight item, um, uh, an eight item battery of indicators of energy transition. Uh, we also asked them who should be responsible for it, because um, if in order to, to generate political action or, or, in, or public policy um, on energy transition, you not only have to have a public that supports taking action, but you need a public who believes that the government should be the one um, who, who's taking action. We asked them about electricity electricity generation, as well as emissions from the oil sands to figure out if there was a difference in support between the two. And then for each of these, we looked at overall levels of support, overall levels of opposition, and whether listening to a news story about it made any difference at all. So um, one of the things that we want, we're very interested in um, in assessing, and so one of our um, attitudinal questions that we asked was about uh, measuring hope in the oil and gas industry up in Alberta, and this is what Albertans told us. So we came at this concept, this idea in two ways. And so we asked people to, people to question a five item, um, strongly disagree, strongly agree, first of all, with the statement that Alberta's economy is too dependent on oil and gas. And we had 18% either agree or strongly agree with this statement. And then secondly, 25 years from now, oil and gas will still be Alberta's most important industry. And 46% either agreed or strongly um, agreed with this statement. And now getting to our responses to our energy transition question. We measured energy transition and support for energy transition through a seven item uh, scale. And so we asked these seven questions, Alberta should expand its oil and gas industry the economy will suffer if we move away from fossil fuels. Alberta should move away from oil and gas. The economy will suffer if we fail to adopt energy such as wind and solar. I am proud of Alberta's oil and gas industry. We should restructure our economy to slow down the effects of climate change and Alberta should move towards renewable sources of energy. And the first, uh, the, the first result that I want to draw your attention to, if you look at the bottom, is that 87% of our respondents supported moving towards renewable sources of energy. And, um, and, and so we have a, a, a very, very strong base of support for that, as well as 70% um, agreeing with the statement that we should restructure our economy to slow down the effects of climate change. <clears throat> But, um, but if you look at another, the, the second element of energy transition, so we're looking at energy transition not uh, as both this movement toward renewables as well as a shift away from oil and gas, there's less support for shifting away from oil and gas. And I think that this is, this is generally what we expected to find that, that um, we are optimistic about moving toward renewables, but still fear the potential losses um, that, that, we, that we might realize by moving away from oil and gas. And only 59% of respondents agreed that we should move away from oil and gas, although still a clear majority of respondents in Alberta. When we look at the forces that shape support for moving toward uh, 
support for energy transition in general. And for each of these elements, or for each of these items, it's concern about climate change that predicts support for most of these energy transition items. So it's not belief in climate change. And so belief in climate change on its own is, is not enough to explain support for these items of energy transition. You need both belief in climate change and concern about it. So it's the concern that becomes the motivating force for support for these elements of energy transition. Opposition to energy transition is most, for each of these items, is most consistently explained by economic conservatism. So for, to measure economic conservatism, we ask respondents questions um, about, their, <clears throat> about their belief or their position on the government's role in the economy. And, and so um, low taxes versus high taxes and degree of government intervention. Now we also, um, the, the second element that consistently predicted opposition is hope in the future of oil and gas. And so, um, so a belief that oil and gas would continue to perform as the most important industry in Alberta in 25 years. So this belief in the future <clears throat> becomes very important. We also asked some questions having to do with the politicization of, of Western alienation and, and regionalism. And, and so which we call the Alberta proud. And so these attitudes, these attitudes of, of grievance, of regional grievance in a sense that Alberta has been mistreated by Ottawa can also predict um, opposition to most of these elements of energy transition. <clears throat> so next, uh, we also asked people to rank who should be responsible for transitioning to renewables and in Alberta. <clears throat> so we asked them if it should be regular people, the federal government, industry, or provincial government. And what this chart tells you is the percentage who chose each of these elements as their top choice and the percentage of respondents who chose each of these elements as their bottom choice. So far and away, the most popular choice of who should be responsible is the provincial government. And so respondents you know, clearly told us that they felt that this should be a provincial responsibility. And um, those who most strongly um, supported provincial responsibility uh, for energy transition and having a strong provincial role were also those who tended, who, who told us that they were worried about climate change, believed that it was human, caused, and they also tended to be NDP supporters. Um, people who did not support um, a provincial government being responsible tended to be economic conservatives and populists. And so people who, um, who um, had anti-elite, uh, expressed anti-elite sentiments. Second most popular choice was industry which um, tended to be supported by women, suburban respondents, as well as economic conservatives, uh, which makes sense because they favor a um, private and industry role over these issues rather than increasing the role of government in policy, <clears throat> in this policy issue. Uh, third choice, federal government at 18%, again, supported by those worried about climate change, but not supported by economic conservatives. And here we have the Alberta Proud, the, the um, uh, regional alienation and grievance comes into this, the politics of grievance. And then finally, um, the uh, regular, those who responded that regular people should be responsible for the energy transition were economic conservatives and populists and women, those, uh, worried about climate change and NDP identifiers tended not to prefer that option at all. And so this question is important because it tells us, because this also helps us to understand pressures for, um, for the creation of climate change policy and, and, and where the opposition is likely to be. And so what happens then when we combine all of these tr questions about transition together? So we take these seven items, which we looked at separately. I presented just the descriptive um, statistics on this and the breakdown of who supported them. But 
if we run a regression analysis on, on this, then we can control for different factors and understand um, how they each contribute to an explanation. So if we first look at sociodemographic predictors of support for energy transition, the way to interpret this graph, if you see this, the, the vertical line down the middle, that's the baseline. So any dot that's to the, the dots that are to the right means that that factor increased support for energy transition. The dots on the left um, means that it decreased support. So out of this, what I will draw your attention to is that, well, we, there is a, an effect um, that, that women tended to be more supportive for energy transition, but uh, the, the strongest finding out of this um, is working in oil and gas and to a lesser extent um, reporting that financially that you've become worse off over the past year. But oil and gas is a very strong effect out of this. These other factors, surprisingly, education really didn't uh, predict anything at all here. Um, we would have expected it to. Um, income as well, not predicting. Um, interestingly as well, suburban and, or, and being rural did not predict anything at all. And I think typically we probably have the stereotype it's that um, Tesla driving city types who put solar on their roof are going to be really supportive of, of renewables and people out in the countryside uh, might not, but um, the data doesn't bear that up. We're not seeing that divide emerge here. And the other interesting thing is as being uh, uh, people who re reported being very religious, um, also that does not um, predict support uh, or predict opposition to energy transition um, with significance. Um, you know, even though we see that dot to the left, it's not a significant effect that we find. Interestingly, however, um, being socially conservative does predict what forms of renewables that, that people tend to like. And so, and so people who reported as being socially conservative tended not to like wind energy as much, um, probably related to its impact on the landscape, we believe. Let's look now at this next slide where we look at values and beliefs as predictors of support for energy transition. And here, the two big things that, or the three factors that really come out. So left-right ideology has us at the top there. It has a small effect. And so if you identify more as right-wing, um, and so you're, then you are, um, it, you are less likely to support energy transition. But the big factors that really predict opposition to energy transition and consistently do, are economic conservatism and future hope in oil and gas. Um, predicting support for energy transition is being worried about climate change and to a lesser extent, social conservatism, interestingly. Now, I don't have, um, I will tell you this, but I don't have the, have the chart to show you right now, is that when we put it all together in the model, the interesting thing that happens is that future hope in oil and gas makes the impact of working in oil and gas disappear. And so what we found is that if you work in the oil and gas industry, you probably expect that those folks would be more resistant to energy transition, so they'd be less supportive. But that's not the factor that explains opposition. It's not working in the oil and gas industry. It's being hopeful about the future of the oil and gas industry. And we were really interested in this finding. And so we've, so our, some of our follow-up research probes into that a lot more and, and what we've done in a, in a subsequent survey and, and some work that we're um, currently writing up is that we've elaborated a, a measure of identification with the oil and gas industry because we were really interested in how people's hopes and fears and whether they felt insulted when someone criticizes the oil and gas industry, whether they feel proud of the industry, uh, whether they have a difficult time imagining life in this province without the oil and gas industry. And so what is whether those um, uh, social identities are more powerful than um, predictions of a more um, objective prediction of, of future economic gain tied to the industry. So we're 
that's something that we're looking into. And that came out of this finding that we found that hope, future hope in oil and gas, it's this belief in the industry that was a very strong predictor. So then the question, so what moves public opinion? What happened when people listened to this news clip about solar energy? And then what happened uh, when they listened to the news clip about the fate of the town of Hannah facing decline um, when it's with the transition away from coal? Well, what we found, we were kind of surprised by this actually. And so we found that the positive, that the good economic news story about solar energy as predicted, increased people's support for um, for energy transition. And, and in particular, it increased people's support for solar, um, for solar energy. Uh, it had a far weaker effect actually on support for wind. And so it was quite particular to solar. The story about Hannah also had a positive effect on, um, on people's attitudes toward energy transition. And we thought, well, that was pretty interesting. And we were kind of puzzled when we, when we, um, when we saw these findings, because I think we had expected that when people were confronted with this story, this bad news story of energy transition has killed a town and, and this, this coal town is in decline and people have lost their livelihood and, and uh, the town won't be the same, that it would generate a backlash and it would generate, uh, and people would blame the energy transition and therefore be opposed to it, but that didn't happen. People, um, in fact, were more moved to uh, support energy transition. And so my guess is that a couple of things are, are happening here. So number one, it might have been a different story or it might have been a different outcome if the clip that we had played had to do with uh, maybe a pipeline shutting down or, or, or not being approved or um, with an oil and gas project not going ahead. Because maybe people have a different identity related to oil and gas than they do to coal. And so maybe that's different. Maybe because coal is a smaller industry, we don't have, it's unlikely that respondents will have that same type of, of response to it. And then the other thing that I thought might be going on here is that this is a story that illustrates the reality of energy transition, that the world is moving away from coal. And so maybe it made it more real to the people who heard this story and it made them more, and maybe that shifted their belief about what will the world look like in 25 years? And so perhaps that's what was doing it. So what does this all mean? What do we, what do we take out of this? <clears throat> so the first, uh, our first conclusion from this is that belief in and especially concern or worry about climate change matters. And it's especially important for explaining um, support for energy transition. But attitudes about the economy and about the future of oil and gas matter more because these are stronger effects that are explaining opposition to energy transition. And, and interestingly for us, it was that beliefs about the future of oil and gas were more important than actually working in the oil and gas industry or having a family member who worked in the oil and gas industry. Secondly, the most consistent economic effects that, um, that we saw out of this came from economic conservatives. And so they were um, the ones who were concerned about um, um, the energy transition having a negative economic impact. And that thirdly, politics and other belief systems or so values which tend to be enduring and quite stable, that they can trump climate beliefs, that these are, these are really, um, they're deeply held and they're very influential in our politics. Some of it is malleable. We learn through these stories that opinion can be shifted. What we don't know from this is how enduring those effects can be. And so it's, um, you know, that's a matter for future research to test how long these elite cues can have an effect on shifting opinion. But finally, and then I think to end um, with, with good news is that 
um, our, this research tells us that there is more of an appetite for energy transition, even in Alberta, even in, the, in our fossil fuel economy here, than either current events in Alberta or elite discourse would suggest. And I think that, I think that this is really quite a positive message. And to me, the, the, this, this, what this data told us about how these beliefs are shaped and, and, and what shapes opposition to energy transition is that it comes down to a quote, and this is, um, and this is a quote from, um, from a scientist at the London School of Economics at their Grantham Center for Climate Change, Bob Ward. The, the, the important question that he identified was what is the growth story of the 21st century? What we believe about that, what we believe about the growth story of the 21st century is going to be enormously important in shaping the political options and political choices that get put on the table and which find support amongst our electorate. Thank you very much. Huge round of applause. I think you can only see me and Cassidy, but we will give you a giant round of applause. Thank you for such an interesting talk. Uh, I feel like I have so many more questions and I love to end a talk with so many more questions that I can ask. Uh, the first question, we actually have a hand raised. So we are gonna jump right into our Q and A. Wonderful. So our first question, uh, is what is the definition of economic conserve of an economic conservative? Is it a libertarian, no government spending at all, or simply someone who describes themselves as fiscally conservative? Okay, so in this, that, that's a great question. So in this survey, we had asked people um, a series of questions about their um, belief in government's role in the economy. And so I'm just oops, trying to escape from my full screen so I can, could look up the actual survey questions. But the, the most important ones for us were ones which they ask in a very general sense, um, do you agree, it, it, it's a statement of, of uh, gov government should have as small a role in the economy as possible. And then it's measured by a range of, uh, on a Likert scale, so agree, disagree. Um, and so we were tapping a number of, of, of questions that, we used a number of questions that tapped people's um, um, agreement with the, the the, the role of government involvement in creating regulations and especially a role in the economy because those were the aspects of economic conservatism that we believed were most relevant to predicting um, policy, policy preferences here, especially in, in energy and climate policy. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that question. Uh, the next question we have is, can you offer any comments on the impact of profession of the provincial leadership? For example, do you think you would have seen the same survey results if it had been done while the NDP was in power? So it was, this was done straight after the provincial election. So we hadn't really, um, but it, it was an election in which um, energy and climate policy was centrally, um, it was a central issue. And, and, and so I think that it was very top of mind for, um, uh, for respondents. I do think that some of the talking points for the, for the UCP really tapped into some of these sentiments. And so they, they, they tapped, you know, definitely into the pride in, in oil and gas and, and um, you know, belief in, um, belief in the important role. So the, those, those examples, the social media examples that I gave you earlier on in this presentation, those are from a little bit later. But it's, if, if you look back at the time, you can still see a lot of communication that is in the same vein. And so I do think that, um, well, we know from research that elite cues 
have this kind of priming effect and that it, it, can, it, it can serve to frame issues in a certain way in people's minds. And so we do think that this framing of the issue has played a role in shaping people's attitudes to energy transition. And, and we believe that our, um, our experiment results confirm this as well, because exposure to that minute and a half news clip moved public opinion. I would hazard to guess that exposure to social media posts or uh, you know, other media coverage of a similar, uh, maybe a, a, of the message of you know, Alberta's oil and gas industry being under attack would have a, have a similar, uh, similar effect as well. So yes, the way that we communicate about the, royal, about the role of oil and gas in our economy is really important in shaping uh, the public support for these policies. I have a few questions surrounding this, but we just have one clarifying thing from the audience is, mm -hmm. how are you defining elite when you're talking about elite cues? Okay, so when I talk about elite cues here, so um, I talk about them in a couple of ways. So it's a bit of a broad umbrella term to cover. So it could be coming from the media. So in the, or it could be coming from political leaders. So it's those in a position of power to really disseminate a, a message. And, and so, um, in, so in this case, and for the purposes of this article, I'm also talking about the media because they're gatekeepers. They choose which stories um, get, get published and they choose how those stories are framed. And, and so our experiment was focused on the media as elites. Does the source of the story influence the response? Is that something you've looked at? Like whether it comes from yeah. government, from industry, business, scientists, does that source impact how people perceive the message, whether they trust it, um, if it impacts them more? Oh, it does, it does. And you know, here, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm gonna show you. <laughs> Here's another one I found. <clears throat> and so we, we followed up and, and so in our next, in our subsequent survey, which we deployed across four Canadian provinces, we were interested in whether people responded differently depending on the messenger. And so um, we were uh, t testing the, um, how anti-elitism affected the reception of a message. And so we, we, and we, so we, we used a message by Mark Carney um, and he was talking about the potential risks of a, of a late energy transition, um, the potential economic risks of ending up with stranded assets or otherwise um, not fully recognizing carbon related financial risks, as well as missed opportunities from failing to be an early mover in investing in renewables. And we found out that if respondents um, were ident were anti held anti elitist views, and so if they agreed with questions such as, or if they didn't trust scientists, or if they agreed with um, questions such as, you know, the average people should be in charge rather than um, uh, a few leaders or elites. So anti elitism can play a big role, and this is why I found this oil sand strong um, on my Facebook feed one day, and I thought, oh, this is so interesting because it's, it's, it's really very clever actually, because it, it taps directly into that feeling, like don't listen to those scientists or you know, don't listen to the federal government or the scientists or whoever else, or in this case, maybe Hollywood stars who are protesting the oil sands. <clears throat> and it's, it's going to be effective uh, with an audience that does hold those anti-elitist views. As scientists, people working in the energy transition, is there something that they should be doing in their messaging to try and avoid that kind of distrust around it? Well, um, you know, the good news is, is that it wasn't a large effect and there weren't, uh, it, it, there weren't a large number of people who held really strong anti-elite um, attitudes. And so it's not, and, 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 and the people who hold those attitudes are probably also um, part of a segment that are not a very persuadable 
segment of the population. And so I, I, I think the message would be carry on, <laughs> make your message heard. And um, I think you'll, I think by aiming to communicate effectively and, and persuade um, the other chunk of the population, that's, um, I, I think that's the, that's really the best hope. You need to just keep inundating all those positive stories that you found were making a difference, just more and more get our, yeah. get stories out there. I think so. And I think, you know, and there's another implication as well. And I think it's really important that we have a discussion about the impact of energy transition, as well as the impact of failing to transition, because it's, it's a very, it, it's a serious, um, it, it, it has serious policy consequences, serious um, social and political consequences. And we need to have a discussion and a debate about what does the future look like in Alberta? We are a fossil fuel intensive economy. Um, and I think that the fact that, that oil and gas is such an important industry here makes it more important rather than less that we look at energy transition and ask ourselves, what does it mean for us? What does our future look like in 25 years? If we're really dependent on oil and gas now, what does that change look like? And who is going to lose out? Because there will be winners and losers. And this is the problem with energy transition more broadly. And we're, it's about to be highlighted. And I think if over the next um, six months, and especially um, if conflict escalates in Ukraine and, and between Russia and, and, and um, the Western allies, we are going to see um, increasing um, um, energy prices in Europe, gas shortages related to um, Russian um, tactics. Um, we're also seeing um, an increase in in the price of renewables, and 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 one and one of the problem here, and and this is something that that McKinsey report warns about, is that with energy transition, it's this massive investment now, and so this this cost, and so costs will rise, and we're we're you know, and due to COVID and supply chain problems and all sorts of other factors, we're, we're entering into this period of increasing inflation. And so politically, this could become a very big deal. Um, but, you know, the prices will rise before they fall and, and they will fall, but um, it is only going to become more contentious and there will be winners and losers from energy transition. And so talking about what we do about that, how do we, cushion the transition? How do we help those communities that will be most impacted? How do we help those workers who will be most impacted? Absolutely. It's such an important way to talk about the issue because it's not just bring in solar, bring in wind. It's There's a reason we are doing that and how do we address it? Um, absolutely. Uh, we have some questions surrounding how your uh, your study was done, if we can mm -hmm. shift into that a little bit. Um, so one of the questions was, if you could remind everyone how many people your survey reached and who it was going to, um, okay. if you were trying to reach really oil and gas people or everyone, yeah. or who was the focus? So it, it is, uh, the survey went to 2,634. Well, those are the number of responses that we got uh, from the survey. And so it was a, it was a panel, it was um, fairly representative of the population um, um, as reflected by the census, but not perfectly. And so the panel recruited uh, by the, sur the survey firm that we use tends to skew a little bit more educated, a little bit more NDP supportive, so, but also more oil and gas workers in our sample compared to what you would find in the general population. So that is, that's the, the, that's the bias, but it's um, with that number, it's that, it, it's a fairly high, that's quite a high quality um, survey with that number of responses. And, um, um, and was there, I wonder if there were any particular follow-ups on that, or does that answer the question? I think that answers the question. Okay. Um, if there are some follow-ups, feel free to pop them in the chat. Uh, anyone who wants to know some more details. Um, the next question was on, you were talking about learning more about the hope in oil and gas. Mm -hmm. um, they were just wondering 
what other research questions are you looking at kind of in that area? Okay, so in this, so when we designed the survey that went to the four Canadian provinces, we, um, we developed a set of questions that tapped more into, actually not tapping more into hope and oil and gas specifically, but more um, a range of questions that had to do with how people identify with the oil and gas industry. So it's, it, it taps into emotional responses. And so um, asking questions such as when, when the oil and gas industry is criticized, I personally feel like I feel personally attacked and, and the extent to which people agree with that, or I am proud of the industry. So tapping into pride, into um, a defensiveness. Um, another question was, it's, I find it difficult to imagine um, a future without the oil and gas industry in Alberta. And so whether that the, the idea of the industry is so tied up with their idea of the sense of place here. And so those were the um, the, the questions and um, and they te they tend to hang together quite quite well as an index. Wonderful. Uh, I feel like we can just have you back next year and you can tell us all about the new <laughs> things we're finding. Um, the next one we had was related to COVID. Um, your survey was pre-COVID. Yeah. Um, do you plan to do another one kind of post, knock on wood, post COVID? Um, and do you think there'd be a big difference similar to if there's a different political party in power? I, you know, we, so we've done a mid COVID study because our, our second survey was conducted in the age, in the age of COVID. We've, we've, you know, we've not, you know, the two surveys can't really be directly compared. So that's our problem. So we can't see a clear difference there, but we have another one that will go into the field um, quite soon. And so maybe if we postpone that a little bit and who knows, who can predict what will happen? <laughs> it feels like it will jinx it if, if we um, hope too much, but um, uh, we might be able to see some effects. We, we've not seen anything yet that jumps out at us in the in the data from our mid-COVID um, data. But what I'm, you know, what I wonder about because if we were to see impacts from COVID, what we might what we might expect to find would be a couple of things. So, so maybe people are feeling even more economically insecure because COVID brought pretty big economic disruptions to people, and so if a sense of economic insecurity and disruption is driving um, decarbonization backlash, then maybe that's a part of it. On the other hand, COVID also brought transformation to the way we did things. I mean, will, <laughs> will the world of work ever be the same again? Will we be nine to five Monday to Friday at our jobs or will, be, will we, will more flexible arrangements become more normal? I think that COVID's really upended the way that we've done things. And we probably will end up online shopping a whole lot more than we did in the past. And that some things, some changes will stick. And so do the disruptions that COVID brought us, will those have, might those shift the way that we think about how the future rolls out? I mean, I, I also think that um, beyond COVID, there are other um, developments in the world that might affect this. And so the election of a democratic president in the United States and then them rejoining um, the Paris Agreement and, and repledging those commitments might make a difference. Uh, the European Union, um, although there's, you know, it's, it's not a, it's not a um, issue that, that people probably have a broad awareness of so that it probably wouldn't impact public opinion in a great deal, but, but they have a very ambitious energy transition strategy that's rolled up into their multi-year financial framework. One of the pieces of that policy package, which is not yet implemented, is a carbon border tax. And so we're curious, if all of a sudden the world becomes a world where there's a threat of a carbon border tax, and so we suddenly worry whether or not we can export our goods without penalty, will that shift our opinion? Will we think 
Will our idea of what our world looks like in 25 years, will that start to change? So I think that recent changes in the year and COVID's all wrapped up in that, that has a role in maybe changing the way we imagine the future. And the way that we imagine the future, I think is a big key to this. Touching on what you just said about all those international mm -hmm. things beyond the Canadian borders, is that something that you can look at in a future, in future research in how do those international impacts influence our opinions here? Well, the, what we've been doing, looking at that, we've got another project aspect to our project where we were, were, because we know that this imagination about the future economy is really important. What we started looking at was how um, economic elites and so firms, how firms talk about energy transition and climate related risks. And we looked at um, hundreds of annual reports from companies listed in Europe on the Euro stocks, on, in the US on the S&P um, and um, on the TSX in Canada. And so we've been tracking how their language about climate related risk has been shifting. Uh, and we, we, we looked at a whole set of these um, from 2013, so from before the Paris Agreement, and then a set of these in 2019 to track how this language shifts over time um, across jurisdictions, because each of them are operating in jurisdictions with different climate regulations and, and also across industries. And it's really fascinating to see how these worldviews are different, where some of these companies, they, they list energy transition and climate change as the key challenge that the world is facing. They, they highlight it on the front page of their annual report, they spend a lot of time talking about it and they, and, you know, and, and others bar barely mention it. And so we see a difference in worldview. So how do we imagine the world to be? What role does climate change play in that? Do we notice it in our strategic communication about the world as we see it and how it will change, how it might change next year and the year after that and the way it will affect us? Are we, are we, making note of that and are we talking about it? Absolutely. Oh, I have so many more questions. Uh, and thank you everyone who is sending in all of your questions. Uh, we are having amazing interaction in the chat. So keep sending them. We will do our best to answer them all. Uh, jumping back to an earlier question that I missed. Um, so talking about those elite cues again, mm -hmm. um, based on the research you mentioned, how much does a tweet by the premier or something like that shape the public discourse around oil and gas industry? And how much is it chasing a discourse that's already happening? Uh, well, I have to I have to caution that we've not studied tweets or attempted to measure their impact in any way and so my you know my answer will just be based upon how I would see it it's 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 contributing to a narrative but it didn't create it <clears throat> the, the narrative was there and a tweet reinforces it a tweet uh, it reinforces it supports it and the other interesting thing that you can do if you study tweets is that it allows you to see networks so who retweets it so you get to see who amplifies this message? So where does it travel, and how does it, um, you know, how how does it does it influence discourse? And there's been, you know, on another topic on researchers that have been looking at misinformation and, and say COVID, they've been able to see, you know, how big these message messages get and who they travel between. So um, the answer is, it's it's a contribution to a discourse that is already there and. There are lots of cool things you can do to measure it, but we've not done that yet. Again, just more future research. We'll just come up with all of these ideas uh, just to have research into the next 100 years, into all of this. Um, next question that we had uh, is related to that story that you shared surrounding coal. Um, did it specify whether the coal, whether it was for steel making or thermal power generation? Um, I believe that power generation is now one of the most expensive options. So I'm wondering if that impacted how economic conservatives responded to it. So 
did the content of the video beyond related to just the town impact how people reacted to the story? It, um, so I think, I think that, so the content of the video is very much focused on the economic impacts for that town and the people. So it was what it was a, it was a human angle story on people in the town being worried about what comes next for their small community. And so this is why I would, I, I would guess that economic conservatives would not be, um, would, would not necessarily be moved by that clip to oppose energy transition because they might see, okay, market forces, <laughs> dying industry, but um, um, but it what but it was least effective on you know even on um, economic conservatives and so you know that that market forces logic was not all powerful in in that clip and so it, it was about the story was about the closure of the Travers um, facility in um, close to the town of Hannah. Well, thank you. And thank you, Josh, for your question. Uh, so jumping into industry, um, you talked about how companies in different places are talking about climate change differently, energy transition, the impact that is having on us and what we need to do. Is there a way to measure whether companies are just putting the words on the front page or if they are actually doing something um, and how that impacts their interaction, their maybe their influence on the communities that they're interacting with. So it's so with these annual reports, um, it could, so companies who talk about climate change and being very concerned about climate change might also be the same companies that are um, desperately trying to continue to make a living out of burning fossil fuels. And so we know that some of it is greenwash. The way that we approach this is that we approach these annual reports and, the, and what they say about um, climate change, energy transition, climate risk as strategic communication. And, and so while, you know, so we, we had a coding frame where we coded um, what we found in these reports and, and one element of the, of the coding frame does deal with specific actions that the um, that the company takes, we were more interested in how they are framing the, the language because that also tells us something useful. Uh, because we can what we what we can do then down the road is we can take it and cross reference um, our coding and and the, the 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 strategic language that's being used with the actual climate performance score that external bodies have. Um, have, have given that company. And so there is, there's no shortage of, of um, firms and consultancies and products that attempt to rate firms. And so that can be handled that way, but um, it, it's not necessarily a, a big, a huge problem for us if it's greenwash because it's what we're most, um, interested in is if the language shifts in, in such a way as to open up new potential um, possibilities for action. And so suggesting possibilities for new um, cooperation or uh, coalitions that are supportive of specific policies, for instance. Um, one of the things that we found, so in, in our early analysis, so we presented a, a, an early version of this research at a conference and one thing that really emerged from 2013 to 2019 on this was <clears throat> we saw, first of all, a decline in climate change minimizing or climate change denialist language, as we called it. And then in, in the companies that um, also expressed a moral commitment to climate change, we also tended to find that these were the, the companies that also tended to use a lot of language that highlighted innovation, technical progress, change, investment, research and development, um, and also talked about the world in terms of a changing, transforming world. 
the companies that used tended to use climate denying or minimizing language or just ignored climate altogether. We also tended not to find this language about the, the companies professing to have a strategic advantage through innovation, technology, research and development, et cetera. And I thought that that was really very interesting. Uh, that is extremely interesting that the, the correlation between those two different areas uh, and can we, it, it, we can use that to, to build these companies to go even farther because if they're creating a culture of innovation and pushing the boundaries of what's possible, then potentially they are building up an organization around themselves that whether it's greenwashing or not, that will maybe shift into that. Uh, as they hire more people and and I, and I think the other thing that it does is that it 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 shifts the public discourse i think it shifts the public discourse about energy transition to one that's identifying the economic opportunities that are present in a period of rupture and change and i think that's really important so it's back to this question what is the growth story of the 21st century and so there are some companies energy transition is the growth story of the 21st century. Uh, really bringing out the importance of communication in all forms, this so much. Um, so we did have a question about that growth story early on. Um, and Kimberly, if I don't explain it correctly, please jump into the chat and correct me. Um, but that question of the growth story is it presupposing or doesn't that question presuppose growth and curtail degrowth? I suppose it does, but it does also isn't the 21st century is a pretty long century as well. So I think, you know, going back to this, this warning that came, you know, first of all, the warning that came from McKinsey that it's not all rosy skies, there are bumps in the road first, you know, there are two parts to this. So first, on an energy transition, that the initial shock will have winners and losers. And that the, the, then the other part is, um, there's an, that we need a debate about what does that economic growth story look like? And so it, should that growth be degrowth? I mean, should it be, um, can it or can it be growth in the terms of um, maybe universal access to cheap and available and efficient and non-polluting energy in um, a way that that effect that that can avoid other effects of growth? I mean, it, it brings into other other questions like population growth as well. But um, I think. Certainly, you know, normatively and and very practically, there is an important debate in there about what are the limits to growth, and and um, and and this is the the um, th that's one of the dangers with any sort of capitalism, including a green capitalism, is that if it's if it's prefaced on a need for growth and continuing um, uh, higher returns quarter after quarter, then that can can create. Um, unsustainable pressures as well. So what does that growth look like? Absolutely. Uh, Kimberly, thank you so much for that question. Um, so we are talking about um, now, uh, some of the questions are surrounding uh, the political side. So your results found that a majority of Albertans seem to want to invest in renewables, 59% want less oil and gas, and there's no rural urban divide. So why hasn't there been a political party that has built a platform on pro energy transition? Is it just too new for them to have caught up? Well, <clears throat> I think I think that maybe the NDP came closest to a solution when they were in power where they they figured out that um, that a more aggressive push toward a made in in Alberta climate plan had to be coupled with uh, support for the oil and gas industry. Otherwise, it became politically impossible. And so having a, you know, even the broad margins of support for 
more renewables you know, in, in Alberta that we have. And even the majorities, the smaller majorities of support for moving away from, from oil and gas you know, still leaves us with the difficult problem that those people might not be the same people who are very motivated and organized and go and vote. And also, um, <clears throat> they're not the same people who are um, funding political parties <laughs> as well. And so these are the barriers that we see in, in political um, systems with this, this um, mismatch between what we see in public opinion and the policies that we see actually emerge. Do you think that your kind of research could be used by political parties to kind of inform those next steps? Um, is it something that you share? Uh, one of the questions from the audience was, how do you disseminate the results of your study to the relevant authorities? Because it seems like there's a disconnect between research and government. Well, we've had with this research, we had a, a opinion piece that we wrote and published in policy options, um, for example, and then, you know, even giving, giving this talk today as well, <laughs> this is how I get the word out, but um, we, we published an opinion piece in, in policy options that's, that talked about the importance of the way that these economic futures are imagined and communicated and, and how that can influence public opinion. And so, uh, those are some of the channels that we use to to get the word out with our research. We are thrilled that you are here sharing mm -hmm. your research uh, with with all of us. I feel like we've all learned so much. Uh, I think we've got one last big question. Um, that's a big one, so I'm going to apologize <laughs> in advance. What's your advice to people who are concerned about the future, concerned about climate change, or on the other side, concerned about the future of oil and gas? Do you have any advice on, on how we can use your research to, to move forward in this energy transition? I think, gosh, I think, um, talk to people, talk to your friends, talk to your neighbors, write to your MLA. Um, you know, don't underestimate the impact of writing a letter to your MLA that is not a form letter, <laughs> of writing your own individually crafted letter. They get read. Um, I think that um, uh, I think that when we are in crises, you know, when we have really important problems, then we are called to be good citizens. And so we exercise the rights that we have. And so, and that's to vote, to speak up, um, and to, to reach out to your elected officials. To learn more. So thank you all for being here tonight, exploring the energy transition with us. Um, huge round of applause again thank you laurie that was an amazing talk uh i am definitely going to rewatch this video when i create the video so <laughs> keep an eye on future energy systems youtube channel we will post this talk uh, in the chat we have posted links to the research that laurie has done you can explore so much of it um, as well as an article published today on future energy systems, uh, the research page, as well as ways to connect with future energy systems. So we hope to connect with you. We hope to see you again at future talks. Lori, any final comments that you'd like to make before we pass it off to Cassidy? Just to thank everyone for coming out tonight and, and listening to my talk and to, to thank you and Cassidy very much for the opportunity. It was such a pleasure. Cassidy, any final remarks from the library? Uh, just echoing the thank you. That was such a great discussion. Thank you everyone for the questions. Um, I really, uh, for me, seeing people wanting to engage with this information is really why the library is so excited to partner with Future Energy Systems because that's where we see our role being, right? How do we connect people with information, engage them with it? So I'm very excited and thank you so much. Um, as Valerie said, there's so many great links. I will email those all to you. So if you are frantically trying to write links down right now or capture them, 
don't worry. I'm sending you one last email this evening that has them all captured as well as uh, the link to the Future Energy Systems YouTube so that when this video is up, you can watch it again and pull different uh, little tidbits of knowledge out of it at your leisure. Absolutely. Thank you all again so much. Uh, don't slip on the ice if you're in Edmonton. Uh, stay healthy, stay safe, and we hope to see you next month. Bye, everybody.